reaction and review. Tonight, guys, I'm checking out a horror film from 1922. That movie is the legendary Nosferatu. I'm going to tell you guys, in my lifetime, I have not seen a lot of silent films, and on the short list of ones I still want to see, Nosferatu has always been at the top of that list. This is one of the most legendary horror movies of all time, specifically because it is one of the first horror movies of all time. I finally got a copy of it, I get to finally watch it, and I thought, I'd, and I thought what the hell, I'm going to do it for reaction and review, and you know what? My timing could not have been better. There is a thunderstorm brewing outside, and it is setting one hell of an awesome atmosphere for this movie. I am absolutely psyched. I have no idea if this movie is going to be any good at all. The only way I'm going to find out is if I shut up and I push play, and I'm going to do that right now. So, without further ado, it's time to kick back, relax, and check out Nosferatu. You know, guys, I completely forgot about one minor little, I guess we can call it a quirk about silent films, and that was the horrendous habit of the actors to overact on camera. Now, that's partially because there was no mic to pick up what they were saying, so they had to really make everything all boisterous, they had to do like a whole lot of like body movement, like they had to do a lot of body language in order to get feelings across. And if you know about it, it's not it's not too bad. If you're not used to silent films, though, it can totally bother you. It's it's been so long since I last watched one of these. It's gonna take a little bit for me to get used to the really really horrific overacting going on in here. Just thought I'd share that. Well, guys, I can say this much. One. Uh, I was talking about that storm. It is now pouring outside, and it is really helping with the whole tone of the film. That is awesome. Now, two, about the movie itself. Max Schreck's performance here is probably one of the creepiest fucking vampires I have ever seen. And it has to do with his look, his body language, everything about him just screams fucking creepy. And it works incredibly well. I am really digging this thing. Alright guys, uh, I think I have found the one thing in this film which is creepier than Max Shrek's poor trail of Dracula. And that's whoever the hell is playing Renfield. This guy does look legitimately out of his fucking mind. It works. And it works really fucking well. Well, guys, I am able to say one thing. Um, I'm not sure if the music used in this copy of the movie is, like, the stuff that was... I'm not sure if this music is the music which was originally sent with this back in 1922, but a lot of this is really catchy. This piece especially, well, that piece especially, has played quite often, and it's really catchy. I'm really digging it. I'm really liking a whole lot of the score here. There are a couple of problem bits, but I'll talk about that when the movie's done. So, wait, 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 wait. So, this room full of, I'm going to assume, we're supposed to be intelligent human beings. Find a ship full of dead guys, what with, like, two dead bodies in it. Both of them with little bite marks on their neck. And they immediately assume the plague because there were rats on board. I understand, guys, that the plague was a terrible thing. I didn't know that one of the surefire signs of telling that the plague was there was having two little bite marks on your fucking neck. Just seems a little bit odd, guys. Well, guys, that was Nosferatu. Normally, I would have to shut the movie off, but because movies this old don't normally have closing credits, it dumped it right back into the DVD menu. Also, I mentioned that storm. The storm has now since completely passed, so... In fact, actually, the storm passed almost with perfect timing with the movie ending, which is sort of cool. Anyway, uh, before I start talking about the movie itself, uh, a couple of things. One, um... A lot of the problems I have with this movie 
have more to do with the film's age and just how films were done back back then. So I am going to make note of that when I mention certain things that bothered me and may bother other younger viewers. Uh, you know, I am going to mention that, and then I am going to stress that that was how most films were done back then, so it's not so much a problem as much as a sign of the times. Number two, I know some of you are probably wondering why exactly I was referring to some of these characters as Dracula and Renfield and so forth as I was watching the movie. Because some people who know of this movie know that the vampire's name is Count Orlock. There is a story behind that, and I do want to kind of share it because it is a rather fascinating story. Back in 1921, when this movie was being filmed, it was intended as an adaptation of Bram Stoker's Dracula. A ridiculously loose adaptation, but still a, a fucking adaptation regardless. And as such, the film carried the names of the characters from the book. So we had Dracula, and we had Jonathan Harker, and we had Abraham Van Helsing, we had Renfield, we had all these other characters. Uh, well, because it was, well, because it was an unauthorized adaptation of Stoker's book, Stoker's widow threatened to sue. And as, I guess, a fucking attempt to avoid the lawsuit, the film was edited at one point with all of the names from Stoker's novel replaced with uh, brand, new, br brand new names, the most known of which is the vampire was renamed Count Orlock. The print I watched contained all of the Brahm Stoker names, so I'm going to refer to them as Dracula and Harker and Van Helsing and so forth as I go through with this anytime I have to mention a character. Just sort of wanted to share that. Now, on to the movie itself. Let's talk about writing. Um, one problem with a lot of these silent films is pacing. And the reason why pacing was kind of a problem is because movies were still... Even even in, even in 1922, movies were still kind of sort of a new thing. They had only been around for about, like, 25 years or so in, in, any real, in any real serious sense. And storytelling was done a little bit differently because they had to, because they had to put the dialogue on screen. Uh, they would they would hold that dialogue on screen as long as they possibly could in order for even the slowest reader in the audience to read what was being said and figure out what the hell is going on. Uh, and on top of that, we also have shots which hang for the longest possible time. We have shots drawn out forever and a day. And some of that brings the pace of the movie to an absolute shrieking halt which is a crying shame, because if this movie were re-edited with all of that fixed, the pacing would be infinitely better. In fact, I may actually do that, because this movie is, this movie is in the public domain. That means that you're free to take it and do whatever you want with it. I could totally re-edit this film, and I may just do that. Not totally sure yet. Anyway, um... And, you know, as much as I'd love to complain about the pacing and how a lot of these shots just drag on and it brings the story to a screaming halt and how we will have certain things re we will have certain things re repeated and they just stay on screen for so long. For instance, uh, Mina gets Mina gets a hold of Jonathan's book that he found about fucking vampires. She finds this passage about how vampires can only be beaten if a woman who is pure of heart gives 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 her gives her blood to the vampire, and then keeps the vampire by her by by her side until morning, um, which is spread out across two text two text screens. They couldn't like scroll it or anything, so it was two totally different screens. And she looks at that, and she looks at that passage in the book twice. Both times, it hangs on screen for a ridiculous amount of time. And in and in this instance, when you are looking back on something, you probably don't need to have it on screen for as long. And it kind of brought the pacing down slightly. Um, we will see like a shot of a character just standing there. As if fucking waiting to be told to you know go, and then they finally start start moving. We have we we have shots that hang like that for so long, 
and it does bring the pacing down. However, again, that was sort of that was sort of the way of the thing back. I mean, that, that that was sort of the way films were back in the 20s. It's not it's not a problem so much as it was just commonplace. And so you have to kind of look past that and understand the age of the film. Um while we're talking about the age of the film, I do want to discuss the music on this DVD. I mentioned that I'm not sure if this was the score that was sent out with the movie when it was released in 1922. I kind of have doubts on that, very strong doubts. I'll get to that in a sec. And some of the music that is on this DVD is ridiculously catchy. It would probably be a hell of a lot better, though, and I know I mentioned one piece of music... But that one piece gets used a lot. In fact, there's maybe, all told, in on this DVD, there's a score of perhaps eight songs, and they play just, like, randomly, it seems. Like, very, very rarely do you do you ever have a music, a music cue that actually syncs up with a scene. Not only that, some of these almost sound as if they've been digitally fucking, like, distorted somehow. Which is very weird, considering a film from 1922. Once more, I don't think the score was the original film's score. Anyway, um, another problem with the music, at least again on this DVD, is that certain songs will cut out in mid fucking note. You'll have about a you'll you'll have about a second of silence, and then a totally different song kicks in, and the song may not have any real tonal, like, tonal, uh, tonal appropriateness for the scene shown. And once more, this could be totally fixed if somebody went back and they rescored the entire film, which could very easily be, be, you know, done. And fuck, you actually could fix that by just, by just hitting play, muting it, and then playing whatever fucking music you want. So you could, so you could literally mute this thing, you could fire up some fucking, you could fire up some fucking kiss and blast out to 70s fucking rock while watching this, and it's not really going to impact much because, fuck, you know, the music here barely, ba barely tries to set any kind of fucking atmosphere. Um... However, though, like I said, what is here for music at times is fairly fucking decent. So I am going to at least praise a couple of the fucking tracks. Uh, acting. Let's touch on acting. I mentioned earlier the uh, gross form of overacting that went on back in the uh, 20s and even back in the teens and in the earliest days of film, where actors, if they have to be where if actors have to show, like, sorrow, it's not just them, you know, looking, looking kind of sort of fucking, you know, like, down or sad. No, no, they have to absolutely, like, lose it, and they gotta, you know, like, and they basically like slam their face into their into their hand, and the shoulders have to shake. Like they need to really just go all out in order to make sure that the viewer can tell what feeling is being shown, because they can't hear if the actor is laughing or crying or if they sound angry. So they have to use body language in order to make everything work. And in a lot of cases, that totally works here. But there are certain actors who, oh my god, they just overplay it. Most of it are the extras. I am not going to, I'm not going to dump on our stars, our main characters. All of them are doing a halfway decent job. It's all the fucking extras who might be in the background or they might be in like a crowd shot. And like, okay, so... For instance, Renfield breaks out. He kills. He goes. He goes. And he fucking like kills this guard. He breaks out, and he's running through the city. And this angry mob is chasing him. Occasionally, swear to fuck, you will see a handful of villagers who are running and looking all pissed, and they have this big, big fucking sneer on their face, and they're like waving their arms like this as they're fucking running down a fucking like country fucking road, and it looks so weird and so out of place. And that's sort of a thing, is that the extras just absolutely, like, ham it up, and if you pay too much attention to them, you are going to spend more time laughing than you are actually getting sucked into the amazingly written, although somewhat poorly paced, story that is given to you. Uh, I really I really didn't touch on that in writing, even though the pacing here is sort of an issue. The, the story is really fucking good. 
uh, I really was getting into into the story. I really fucking loved it. Um, but yeah, acting from all of our extras is just fucking trashy. However, um, I think the best actor is our film's star, our titular no, our titular Nosferatu. You know, Count Morgan Dracula or Count Orlock, depending on the print you're watching was played by a man named Max Shrek. You know how I was talking about the extra with the big fucking sneer and was doing this he was like running down the fucking road? Max Shrek is the total opposite of that. And Dracula in this movie stands stock fucking still. Shoulders are up like this. God, this hurts my shoulders to do. And he stayed like this for long fucking shots. And he sat there with his arms like rigid or else he'd have them like curled upwards like this. It looked so weird and it looked so out of place. And the body language that Shrek used on top of all of the makeup, I'll touch, I'll touch on special effects in a minute. All of it just comes, it comes together and it makes the, and it makes the character look like an absolute monster, which is saying a lot. He is, all right guys, Max Shrek is the reason to watch this fucking movie. He really, really is. You just watch how, you, you just watch what he does as Dracula or as Orlock and it works fucking beautifully. He is the reason to watch this movie. He is the best actor amongst the entire cast. I mentioned the makeup. Let's segue right into makeup. Really, the one thing you have to, to look at with makeup is Count Dracula, because there is very little in terms of, like, in terms of, like, makeup effects beyond that. Um, outside of the fact that Renfield is obviously wearing a bot, is, we is obviously wearing a fat suit, and looks like he might have, like, a skin fucking cap on, looks kind of creepy. But Dracula, Max Shrek is transformed into this vampire who looks like nothing else you've seen on you've seen on on this planet. The character has, I mean, the actor has on a fucking skin cap, which looks almost like it starts at the fucking eyebrows and goes all the way back. He has these ultra pointy ears. He has these. He has these long goddamn like nails, which which don't even look like nails. They actually fucking look like flesh covered claws, and they look absolutely amazing. And when you have all of that on top of the oh, and also the teeth, he has these real. You, okay, guys, now, you know how vampires normally have their teeth, like, down here? Orlocks are, like, the two front teeth spiked out, and it look or Dracula's teeth spiked. Looks looks creepy as shit. You take all of that. You take fucking teeth, the makeup, the body language, the movement, and it becomes one of the most memorable characters you will see in any film. It looks awesome. Now, uh, there are a few other special effects. Occasionally, you will see a vampire bite on somebody's neck, and of course, that's just they have like a close-up. You can see like a couple of like dots there that are that, that are supposed to look like fangs, and that's fine. Um, in terms of blood, considering that this is a horror movie, there isn't now there isn't really a whole lot of blood by modern standards. However, though, what little fucking blood is seen here is certainly a fuckload more than you saw in most other films of the time. The one that, now, now the one that kind of shocked me is, uh, when the ship that Dracula is coming, is coming to England on, lands, and Dracula's been able to grab his casket and flee, and the ship is being looked over, they find the fucking captain who, who, who had tied himself to the wheel of the ship. Behind him is this splatter of blood, and it looks really cool. And it's such a small detail, but it looked so nice. It really was just this amazing-looking shot. I was really happy to see it. Um, so that's me talking about special effects and makeup. Camera work. Uh, there is a little bit I do have to say involving camera work. Uh, a lot of it is very positive. Uh, because, guys, a whole lot of the camera work here is awesome. I have talked about how there were a few shots which went on for a little bit too long. There is one shot where, I swear to God, it kind of sort of looked like a hand was, like, trying to fix the lens. Uh, there are some shots which are which are fucking, which are fucking under friggin' cranked, so everything is moving at, like, twice, at, like, twice the normal speed. Uh, there's one shot which, for whatever reason, is negative. I don't 
totally understand why. Uh, but you know what, guys? Now, barring, though, those few little minor hiccups and fidgets, the rest of this film looks amazing, and it was shot beautifully. Um, there really isn't much else I can talk about. The only other thing I can really say is, um, specifically for this version of the movie, you may want to avoid this specific DVD, and I'm going to explain why. Um, and it's because... A problem with older films, especially older films which are in the public domain, is you run the risk of finding prints that are rather damaged. And there are and there are a lot of shots in this movie where the film is horrendously scratched or it's just very badly, badly damaged. And it makes some of those scenes very difficult to watch because you're trying to watch it through a haze of scratches and other such shit. So, if you can find this thing remastered, I know for a fact that it is on Blu-ray. You can totally pick it up there. They will hopefully have cleaned up most of those shots, or they will have found the best possible, or the they will find the best possible print with the with the least amount of damage, and they'll be able to just run with that. As for this specific DVD, um, if you can find no other version, then by all means pick it up. However, there are definitely better versions out there. I can feel it. There is so much damage on the print used here that it does render certain scenes 100% unwatchable. So, am I able? Am I able to recommend Nosferatu? Oh fuck yes, I totally can. If you can find it anywhere, guys, if you can find it on Netflix, you can buy it on DVD, you can buy it on Blu-ray. The movie is in the public fucking domain. By all means, download it. You have your legal right to do so. Absolutely. If you are, if you are a fan of, if you are a fan, if you are a fan of horror movies and you want to see how horror got its start in film, look no further than this film right here. This sucker here is a classic, and God damn it, it has earned every bit of that title, guys. I did not know what to what to expect going into this movie, but my God, it was really fucking solid. And you know what? I do, I do remember, I got in a comic bento a couple of months ago, a graphic novelization of Dracula. I kind of feel like reading that right now, just simply because I am on a, I am on a little bit of a vampire kick, and God damn it, I don't want to stop. And with that, my friends, we come to the close of another reaction and review. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, take care, and I will see you all in the near future. Peace.